So, so we have to keep that continue. Like this? Hi. There was some technical problem, I guess. So, okay. I don't see the shared screen. Yeah, you are the host. No, I read something. So, I still can share it. Now we can share. Okay. Then let's try again. Okay. So can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. okay. So welcome and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk here. I'm going to talk about random information for recovery in L2. And I want to start with some rather general motivation. Namely, in numerical problems, we have problem which we want to solve to arrive at the solution. And we do this typically by collecting data and then try to approximate the solution. And sometimes we, we can choose how to collect our data, but what if our data comes from random measurements or what, what if we can choose uh, the data? This is a common assumption in learning theory and one advantage of random information is that it's universally applicable instead of adapted to a specific problem where you can choose the optimal information, but have to change your information maybe for different problems. And the power of random information, which I want to deal with here, was investigated, for example, by Eike Hinrichs. David Krieg, Erich Nowak, Joscha Prochner, and Maria Ulrich one year ago. And this work inspired this talk here. So let me give the problem setting, which is here in an information-based complexity sense here. So we have a normed space F, which is continuously embedded into some L2 space and some measure space. And we collect information nn of f, n reals, about some otherwise unknown f in our space, capital F. And this information is given by linear measurements. So it's L1 up to Ln. And these are continuous linear functionals on f. And as output, we return an approximation which we build from uh, the data we have by using a reconstruction map, which takes it back to the L2 space. And we want that this approximation is close in L2 sense to F uniformly in all F over in capital F. And this is depicted here. So we want to approximate basically the embedding here and the, we collect the information and then reconstruct to arrive an, at the approximation in the two cents. Okay, so let me talk about the, how we measure the quality of information before going to random information. And to measure the quality of information, we use the following concept. So we call that we have information nn of f, and we map this using the map phi to an approximation, where phi maps into L2. Now the uniform error of such an algorithm, the composition of such a map phi with the information, is just the supremum over the unit ball in f of the L2 error. And the radius, or also quality or power of, inf of the information map n, n is given by the following. So we just take here the uniform error, 
which we get if we use the reconstruction given by MF5 and then take the infimum over all phi as above. So uh, taking Rn to L2 and these can be really arbitrary phi. So we don't suppose linear phi, for example, right now. Excuse so, me, may I ask yeah. a question? Uh, is it homogeneous uh, definition? I mean, if uh, belongs to ball radius two, mm -hmm. it will be what? Yeah. Um, so the algorithm A, it need not be linear. So in this sense, yeah. yeah. It's a problem. I mean, yeah. it depends on this one, number one. Yeah, that's okay. correct. Yeah. yeah, one could also define it over the whole function space. Yeah, but yeah, I, I chose this setting here in, in this sense. Yeah, but one has to be careful. Thank you. Okay, so this, this we call the radius of information here. And now we have a look at the optimal information we, to have a benchmark on for which to measure the quality of random information and optimal information. For this, we assume that we have a class of measurements available, lambda, which, uh, sub, which is a subclass of the dual of f. And for example, this can be function evaluations. And then information is just of the form as, as before. So with linear measurements here, but these are supposed to be in lambda. Now the nth minimal radius of information, which is the best we can do using n such measurements is given by taking the infimum over the radius, radii of information or all such n, n. And one can alternatively write this as the infimum over all such measurements in lambda, and then also over all phi from Rn to L2. And again, we take here the worst case error over the unit ball and use such a the L2 norm between the original F and the reconstruction we get here. Now, the, so, so, we have that sorry. for any such information that its radius is larger than the nth minimal radius of information. And now the question is, if this is attained in an asymptotic sense, so can we reverse this inequality up to some constant for all n, with, such that we have such an upper bound, or then we have an asymptotic inequality? And is this true for most information maps, or most in a sense of, is this true for random information with high probability? And here, high probability I do not specify this here, but it may be exponential in n. We will see this later. Okay. Sorry, uh, can yeah? I ask you a question? Uh, if we allow arbitrary linear functional information, then we arrive at uh, Gilfant width. Yes? Yes, we come to this later. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So we can model then random information by taking such measurements which are identically distributed on lambda with some measure on this space of measurements and we will see examples of this where this can be made more concrete and i will first talk about standard information and then come to linear information where we have then the galvan glyphs here so first for standard information we take a class of functions and we assume that it's continuously embedded into an L2 space where the L2 space is on this domain where the functions are. Then for standard information, we use the delta functionals, which we assume that they are continuous for the late, later discussion. And then the information is given by taking points in the domain and then evaluating the function at this point. So we have function samples. And for any such standard information, we have that 
it, it's its radius is at least the radius of min, minimal radius of information with respect to the class of standard information. And this is again, at least the minimal radius with respect to linear information because yeah, linear informations are in this setting more uh, uh, a larger set here. And how can we define then the random standard information? So via this correspondence between linear measurements, delta functionals, and the points themselves, we can define random standard information by taking the random measurements based on random points, which are identically distributed with respect to the measure mu, where we take we measure the L2 error. And this is some somewhat natural because in the L2 approximation problem, we give more weight to some regions where we have large measure mu. And here we want to have more points. And one can also define, of course, other notions of random information. But this is the one I will use here. And now for any realization. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Just a question. Do you assume that you know this mu? Um, at the moment, I don't. But I, I will think about it where if there's some place where I assume to know it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because, like for instance, in learning theory, what you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, they usually, and this is what called distribution-free uh, uh, non-parametric statistics and so on. They do not know that mean. Mm -hmm. So that makes a big problem. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I have to think about this. Yes. Thanks. So, if we have such a random standard information then it's for any realization it, it's its radius is at least the nth minimal radius of all standard informations and again this is at least the radius if we allow to take minimal the minimal radius over all linear me measurements and we again ask if this is attained for the random information as asymptotically with some high probability and there's some result which answers this in the positive, namely in the case where we have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space on D. So we have continuous function evaluations, which we assumed. And some basis of this reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is assumed to is be uniformly bounded in the L infinity norm. And we assume that the measure mu is a probability. Then it was shown by David Krieg and Mario Ulrich in 2020 and with an probability improvement by Mario Ulrich that we have with high probability, so sub-exponential in N, in fact, that we have some constants such that the radius of information of this random information is bounded by constant times. So this prefactor here, and here we have a sum over the tail of the nth minimal radii of here general linear information, not only standard information, but yeah, this is smaller than the nth minimal radius or the jth minimal radius of standard information. And in fact, they wrote it down with approximation um, numbers. But here in this case for the Hilbert space, the linear reconstruction maps are optimal. And so we can write it like this. And this gives all, already quite a good bound as we will see for the radius of random information. And let me mention that uh, was the original interest here was the power of standard information versus lin general linear information. And there were some improvements in this direction via discretization and downsampling techniques, which improved here this n over log n to an n. 
And let me mention here the work of Nitsan Olevsky Ulanovsky and the work by Limonova and Pemliakov and the work for, also by Nagel, Schief and Tina Ulrich, which were in this context. And now I want to insert some special sequence here so that we can see how, what to expect here from such a bound. Namely, if this the radius, the nth millimeter radius, standard information behaves like n to the minus alpha times log to the beta with alpha greater than one over two and some beta in the reals, then this bound yields that the radius of random standard information is bounded by n to the minus alpha times log to the beta plus alpha. So here we lose a log to the alpha. And with the improvements, which however, then we have a subset of random points with the downsampling technique. So, but these improve this alpha to a one over two. And in asymptotic notation, uh, I just write it like this. So this is already a good bound, but in fact, random information can be asymptotically optimal for some special spaces. And here, let me mention the Sobolev spaces and if parameter P between one and infinity and smoothness S with S greater than D over P. So we ensure the continue embedding in con into continuous functions. And on some domain, we consider the Sobolev space, the isotropic one, kind like this. And then together with David Krieg, we proved a characterization for the radius of information, which yields for bounded and convex domain that the expected radius of random information for the L2 recovery problem behaves asymptotically like the nth millimeter radius, where the n is n to the n over log n, if p is at most two, and is asymptotically as good as n optimal measurements if p is greater than two. And here this n over log n, this was known in fact before because it's because the random points have holes in them which are of size n to the n over log n in volume. And yeah, what can we derive? further derive. So this bound extends also to other spaces, for example, Helder, yes. Uh, excuse me, excuse yeah. me. Uh, may I ask everybody to switch out no, uh, sound because there is noise. Sorry, excuse me, please continue. Okay. So yeah, the, these asymptotics extend to different function spaces, for example, Helder, Biesov and Tribuli Sorkin spaces with continuous embeddings and also to compact Riemannian manifolds. So we extended this this year to these. And one problem is that it holds for convex domains and we do not know yet how to extend it to non-convex domains, for example, general bounded Lipschitz domains. But we believe that it's also true there that random informations are as good as optimal information if p is larger than two. And to summarize here, random information is often near optimal, up to logs maybe, with high probability. And this is for random standard information. And now I want to switch to random linear information. There, there are also interesting things to discuss. So for linear information, we consider the simpler setting of finite dimensional case with f being r to the m equipped with some norm. And as an L2 space, we have then the L2 m space of sequences with the two norm. 
and here the so we take the uniform error of an algorithm again as such a supremum over the unit ball where the unit ball is now k so a symmetric convex body and linear information is now given by allowing all measurements so the whole class of linear functionals and this can be identified with rm rtdm itself and now such a linear inf information map looks like this it's just um, the inner product with n vectors in rm and yeah this information map is then can be identified with a matrix which we apply to a vector and we would want to recover this vector in the L2 norm. Now, what is the best we can do with such linear informations? For this, I want to elaborate a bit and transfer this to a geometrical setting, namely the radius, again, as before, is defined now by taking the infimum over all phi from Rn to Rm, and again, measuring the sup supremum over all these vectors in the L2 norm. Now, we have the following important relation between the radius inf of information of such an information map Nn and the radius of this convex set intersected with the kernel of Nn, which is this quantity here. And here, here the kernel is defined is just the null space and here we have a constant of two which is yeah, quite a good bound that it can be improved in general and yeah we assume here always that n is at most m be because if we would have m measurements we could recover a vector exactly and we in fact assume that n is much smaller than m and at least n smaller than m over 2. And now we can see what is the best we can do using this linear informations. And in fact, the minimal radius of information satisfies now that it's equivalent to the Gelfand widths, which are defined here. So we just take the infimum over n minus n co-dimensional subspaces of Rm and take the infimum over the radius, which is defined here. So it's the supremum over all x in the intersection with the subspace. And this is at least the Gelfand width. So we can start instead of the radius of information, analogously the radius of such sections. And if we take now random linear information, we arrive at the following. So how should we define random information first? We have the co correspondence between linear measurements and vectors in, uh, in R to the M. And we want li random linear information to satisfy the following. So if it's given by random vectors, y1 to yn. Then we suppose that the directions of this vector should be identical and independently uniformly distributed on the unit sphere of R to the M so that no direction is preferred. Because yeah, we measure the error in the L2 norm, which is you know, rotation invariant. And if we take as a model now the Gaussians, so we take a Gaussian random vector given by n Ga standard Gaussians, then in fact the ind independent copies of this vector satisfy this. So our random information <laughs> will be given by Gaussian measurements. And the random information map is then represented by such a Gaussian n times m matrix like this. Now, what can we say about random 
in linear information, we can again use the previous equivalence to the radius. And now this radius of random information is for each realization equivalent to the radius of k intersected with a random subspace E n run. The, this is the kernel of this random information map. And in fact, it's uniformly distributed over Grismanian, which can parameterizes all such subspaces. And yeah, we exclude the possibility, which of course if the probability no zero, that this is in fact a deg degenerate subspace. And now the radius of random information corresponds to radius of random sections. So these quantities correspond to each other via this above. And we can now ask, is the radius of such a random section, which is at least the n plus first Gelfand width of k, is this much larger than this n plus first Gelfand width? Or do we have, in fact, that this inequality is asymptotically attained to some some constant for all n with some high probability. And we have the following answer to this question, namely the for this we define the nth random Gelfand width, which is given like this. We take the infimum over all real numbers A, which bound this radius of yeah, this random radius with high probability where this high probability is some exponentially high probability fixed in advance. And this means that most sections are at most of this size in radius. And this random Gelfand width is then by definition at least the nth Gelfand width. And we ask if it's much larger and an answer was given by Alexander Litwick and Nicole Tomczak Jägermann that, in fact, we have an upper bound of the random Gelfand width in terms of the Gelfand widths of the convex body, namely uh, some constants su such that we have some one over square root of n, and again such such a tail over the year the n the j Gelfand width times j to the minus one over two. And yeah, this bound is very general. And again, I want to apply it to a special sequence so, so that we can see how, how good it is. And for example, let's take the example that the Gelfand widths decay like n to the minus alpha to the log over beta n. Then we have some constant which is given by this bound, such that with the, the random Gelfand width is bounded by the Gelfand widths. If alpha is larger than one over two, so if we have fast enough decay of the Gelfand widths, then the random sections are as large or not much larger than the Gelfand widths. And if in the case that alpha is equal to one half and beta is at smaller than minus one, then we lose here logarithm. And otherwise the bound does not yield anything for large enough M. So we always want dimension independent bounds, so to speak. And this is, as said, the asymptotic optimality of Gaussian information if the Gelfand widths decay fast enough. Now the question is, is there a lower bound of the size or can we improve this bound? And for this, let's have a look at some special class of convex bodies, namely the ellipsoids. And they are, they are defined like this, where we have some semi-axis of length sigma one to sigma m. And these are connected to L2 recovery in Hilbert spaces, for example, and they are quite nice because yeah, the Gelfand widths can be explicitly computed and they set this, they are equal to the 
next seam axis because yeah we can just cut off what's the question okay and we can just cut off the n the end first seam axis to see that this is two and for the ellipsoids we have the following bound namely we have the bound that there exists constant such that the random Gelfand width is bounded by constant times one over square root n. And here, this tail where we have an n here, and these are the Gelfand widths, or equivalently, here I wrote it down again, the C axis. And here we have some L2 norm of this tail. And one can prove this via the structured random matrices here. But one can also prove this via a lower M star estimate and the technique of rounding, which I maybe come to this later, which was also the idea be behind the bound of Litwack and Tomcha Gegermann. And yeah, now we want to compare these bounds. So the first bound is by Litwack and Tomcha Gegermann applied to the ellipsoids. It says this. And the second bound is specifically for the ellipsoids. And for example, if now the Gelfand is k again like this, then if alpha is larger than one over two, both bounds yield uh, asymptotic optimality for so asymptotic equivalence between the random Gelfand widths and the Gelfand widths. If in the boundary case one over two, beta is small enough, then we lose a log n in the first bound and only a square root of log n in this bound. So at most a square root of log n, we don't know exactly. And if then beta is a bit larger than minus one, this the first bound does not yield anything for large dimension m. The second still uh, yields the square root of log n and if the Gelfand widths decay is low enough, then none of these bounds yields anything. So yeah, what, what can we now deduce? What can we expect? We, we have asymptotic optimality if the Gelfand widths decay fast enough, but, but what happens at the critical case? And just to summarize here the Gelfand widths are not square summable. And then the upper bounds do not yield anything because we took the L2 norm of the tail of the Gelfand widths. And this is understood in this sense. So they, they proved an even yeah, a complementing result, namely the first result I've shown you before yields that random information is almost optimal, so up to a logarithmic factor if if such a uniform bound on the L2 norm. And if this L2 norm diverges, if M increases, then random information can be said to be useless in the following sense. So we have some constant uh, such that for every N, so no matter how many measurements we take, if the surrounding dimension m is large enough, then this radius is larger than c with high probability. And we now want to understand a bit more what happens at this critical case and what to expect for the radius of random information if the Gelfand widths decay not faster than n to the minus 1 over 2 polynomial faster. And maybe as a new candidate by transferring from the ellipsoids, we could conjecture that if we replace ellipsoids by general convex bodies, the bound still holds true. I don't know if this may be true, but this would be a possible way to improve it. And I want to draw some attention to the following similarity, namely for standard information. Well, there's the question that 
we have the, the nth minimal radius, so the best we can do with standard information and compared to the approximation numbers where we allow linear information and linear measurements that we also have such an L2 norm where the yeah, constants do not depend on n again, but maybe on f or mu. And maybe we have such a relation for linear information to for lin random linear information. And maybe some further thing to, to note, if something holds for most linear informations, then maybe it also holds for most standard informations because standard informations are a subset of linear informations. And maybe one can improve these upper bounds and because for linear, for standard information, it may be also true that we have the corresponding lower bounds or we have an asymptotic equivalence here. And this implies that uh, square root of logarithm is lost compared to um, standard information comparing to linear information. And this was also exhibited by Inris Krieg, Novak and Vibrel this year. That, but yeah, we don't know if such, such a relation holds. And maybe one can also ask if a similar re relation holds for the between the random Galfand widths and the Galfand widths. Okay, and to investigate this, we looked at some further special case of bodies, namely ellipsoids, LP ellipsoids, which are generalized the usual ellipsoids by allowing a P instead of the two. And P can be infinite, then we take the maximum. And here are some examples. So P equals two, just the usual ellipsoid. And for P smaller than one, we get non-convex shapes. But yeah, I will discuss this maybe later. So for this LP ellipsoids, we have the following upper bound for the random Gelfand widths. We write, have it in terms of the semi-axis here. So not in terms of the Gelfand widths, but yeah, let's write it down. So the random Gelfand widths are bounded by n to the minus one over two. And if p equals one, we have such a supremum here. And if p is between one and infinity, we have again such a tail where if we set now p equals two, we arrive at the bound from before where the k is um, proportional to n if p is equal to one and it's asymptotically n to the n over p to star for p larger than one where p star here is the Hölder conjugate of p. And the proof idea, we derived it from p, the case p equals two. And it's again via rounding technique and we used Hölder's inequality and some moments estimates for Gaussian vectors. Now we want to derive from this, what does it say compared to the Gelfand widths? For this, we have to know the Gelfand widths of these LP ellipsoids. And it turns out that they're related to diagonal operators. Namely, if we have a diagonal operator with the semi-axis, with multiply e sequence equal to the semi-axis, then the Gelfand widths of the LP ellipsoid are equal to the Gelfand numbers of these diagonal operators. And then we know that these Gelfand numbers are, are in the case P at least two, such a tail over the semi-axis where the S is one, satisfies one over S is equal to one over two minus one over P. If P is at, at least um, is larger than two and where this is equal to sigma n plus one if p equals two as seen before. And in the case p smaller than two, we don't know the Gelfand numbers. 
exactly. We know them up to polynomial order only. So we cannot exactly compare the random Gelfand widths to bound to the Gelfand widths, but only up to polynomial order and more exactly in the case P, at least two where we have the more precise relation here. And we now compare them. And in the critical case, so where n to the minus one, and um, where the Gelfand widths satisfy n to the minus one over two, so the times log to the beta, where they're equivalent to this, we, yeah, we have the following. And let me mention that if they uh, decay faster than n to the minus one over two, then we again have asymptotic optimality of the random Gelfand widths, at least up to polynomial order. And let me put together the statements from before. The statement by Litwick and Tom Egermann said that if the beta is small enough, then we lose at most the logarithm. The ellipsoid bound from before said that if beta is smaller than minus one over two, then we lose at most the square root of logarithm. And the bound I last showed from, from us is if beta is smaller than minus one plus one over p, then we lose such a logarithmic power, which is now larger than the square root of a log. In the case p is larger than two. And for p smaller than two, yeah, we don't know what we lose because we do, do not know the Gelfand numbers. So exactly, so only up to polynomial order. And now the question would be if we have for any convex set K, maybe even that the random Gelfand widths are equivalent to the Gelfand widths multiplied by square root log n, so that we lose some square root log n if the beta is small enough. And if the beta is larger, then maybe random information is maybe useless. We, it would be interesting to know this. And we also have a lower bound, which sheds some further light, but it's only valid on this polynomial scale. And I don't want to go too much into details because I don't have so much time. But essentially, it says if the Gelfand twists decay slow enough, then random linear information is useless. and it, the radius is larger than a constant with high probability. And let me summarize now what we know for the LP ellipsoids. If the P is at least two and the Gelfand widths decay like n to the minus one over two minus epsilon, so they decay faster than n to the minus one over two and the square summable, then random information is asymptotically optimal. And if they uh, decay slower than n to the minus one over two, then random information is useless in this case. We do not know about the other cases and it would be interesting to know this at this fresh threshold. And it would be also interesting to know about um, cases of a Q, Q recovery with Q not equal to two. And we also do not know exactly what happens in the quasi norm case where zero is, bit, is smaller than P, is smaller than one. I, I only show you the briefly the result now and then my time is over. So here's our result for P is between one, zero and one. Then we have just an upper bound for the random Gelfand widths, which we derived from the proof for the LP balls, which is via compressed sensing techniques. And yeah, it extends this results for the LP balls. And we do not know a lower bound in this case. So 
I want to thank you for your attention. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. So any questions? Uh, yes, may I ask a question? Uh, you try to compare this random uh, case with uh, Gelfand Witz, but in this case, you should suppose that K is a good enough position. Is that isotropic or so on? In, in other cases, it's uh, meaningless to, to compare this to quality because uh, the quantity, because uh, you see, if K is very big in one direction, you your random section cannot uh, catch this property. Am I right? Um, I don't quite understand. Maybe, maybe let me say something about it. So, and the, if the semi axis for an L2 ellipsoid decay fast enough, then the random information or the random sections are asymptotically as big as the minimal sections. So if it decays fast enough, and if it's all all thing. Or, or if all CMXs are of the same order and we are in the case of a PBOS or something like this, then yeah, random information, um, yeah, we, we did not analyze this, but yeah, it is large in, in this case. Yeah. I don't know exactly what happens in the isotopic case. But in any case, um, I I think that you should suppose some regularity of your body if you, you, to try to get some general result mm -hmm. because in another case the measure on the subspace is not connected with the property of the body. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I have to think about this. Thank yeah. you. And, and when. Uh, mm can you replace the uh, the probability definition by just a random radius of a random section average radius of a random section okay the random gelfand diff yeah so if you just take average radius expectation expectation so okay so if we just take the expected radius instead of this most definition to so so you ask what if we uh, look at the expected radius or here is a, just a concentration and it's the same please uh, what did you say please so, so maybe you have concentration of measure and okay the, Expect, no, expected radius will be equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I I think this this is true because yeah, this is from the proof technique. It looks like this. Yeah, because uh -huh. the, maybe I show this part of the proof which I skipped. So maybe it's similar here. So. The low M star estimate says that the random Gelfand widths are bounded by such a factor, and then this um, yes, average, namely the M star of K, the mean width. Let me jump back. This is the average in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one has concentration of measure here. Uh, all right, so um, can I thank the speaker and uh, we have.